thanks for joining us today. Um, I know we've got participants listening in and, and, and watching from across Canada, including many current uh, Habitat for Humanity donors, board members, staff from various affiliates across the country, many volunteers, of course. And uh, so I welcome you all from coast to coast. Thanks for taking the time to join us uh, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're joining from. Um, before we get right into the webinar, I do have a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the session is being recorded and we will be sharing it after the webinar is complete. Um, the attendee lines, the participant lines have all been muted and they'll remain muted for the balance of the webinar. You will be uh, able to participate, however, through our um, question and answer uh, portion of the agenda, which is a little bit later on after the individual presentations from our panelists. Uh, I encourage you to use the Zoom. If you look at the dash menu at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A area where you can submit your questions. We'll address the questions uh, during the later part of the webinar itself. If you have any technical difficulties through the webinar um, uh, on the chat, you'll notice there's a, a number that you can call for any technical difficulties and a customer service rep from Zoom will help you with that. Um, and then ultimately, um, hopefully all will run smoothly. So as noted in our invitation, we're talking all things planned giving. Um, making a gift to a charity in your will is a, a topic that many Canadians are not sure how to broach. We are very fortunate to have a panel of prominent Canadian um, planned giving and wealth management experts uh, with us today who are volunteering their time. I love volunteers uh, to talk to us and help us understand the financial and emotional benefits of making this type of gift or, or this type of philanthropy. So we're excited. I'm just going to quickly just name names. We've got Paul Nazareth, who's the Vice President for the Canadian Association of Gift Planners. Perhaps, Paul, you could just wave hello. There he is. Uh, we've got, he's been, he's joined today by Joanne Ryan, who's Vice President of Philanthropic Advisory Services for TD Wealth. There's Joanne. And we have Tara George, who's a senior partner with KCI Philanthropic Services. Uh, all three are uh, known in their worlds and uh, very broadly um, in Canada as specialists and uh, incredible philanthropists in their own rights, um, uh, giving of time, talent as treasure, as Joanne is known to say. Uh, so without further ado, I want to start by encouraging our participants to actually answer a question. Have you thought about putting a charitable bequest in your will? Looks like two thirds of the participants uh, that responded to the poll uh, have thought about this before. So that's interesting. Um, I, would, uh, I was under the impression, perhaps we thought about it like me, but we haven't really done anything more about it. So uh, maybe Paul can give us some insight as to how that links to stats that you have as it relates to people that actually think about it versus people that actually uh, do something more about it and perhaps even make the bequests in their wills. Uh, so over to Paul who will give us some information, some plan giving basics as we start the webinar. Wonderful. So uh, you know what, it, uh, those results were actually just a little higher in uh, the study that we just did, we just did some uh, new data uh, across the country, we worked with Veronics and talked to Canadians of all ages and stages in every province. And it was probably a little lower or in the uh, low 60s uh, of how many people who had considered a gift in their will this way. So excited to be here with you today. As my colleague said, uh, I'm with an organization called the Canadian Association of Gift, which works to bridge uh, the world of charity of financial and estate planning. And we dive into the data and practice of a lot of individuals across the country as they think about supporting their favorite charities this way. And so today I hope to give you some thoughts, some information, and some provocations as you consider your own legacy. You know, we received a great gift and I know many across the country, our colleagues from local Habitat teams may have seen this report that put together all of the data on the charitable sector from the past 30 years, great gift to us from last year, put together by Imagine Canada and the Rita Hall Foundation. And this report helped pull out some narratives for us to understand a bit more about not just charity in Canada and giving in Canada, but how we as Canadians look to help each other. 
Now, one of the more interesting things that we got out of this was, as I said, that, that extended narrative. And in the end, what we're trying to do is support every individual. We need to decouple the world of fundraising from your own considerations of how you want to help. That's what we're really here to do today, is help you can help consider, give you more tools around how you want to help. And I'm going to focus on some questions, some data, and some insights on, in my 20 years in the sector, working for charities, large and small, a wealth management firm. I worked with the charity Canada Helps. And so back to travel the country quite a bit and help individuals as they think about this. Now, starting right now, how do you give? And that's the challenge, is most Canadians give because they are asked. We know that fundraising is something that happens all the time. And in fact, one of the most things is us watching, one, too much American television, and too many of us think that philanthropy is done by philanthropists. Whereas here in Canada, it is everyday people that are really making a difference. This is the front cover of the annual Forbes uh, Philanthropist edition. I never know how Bon Jovi makes it on there, but this is the problem. It is that celebrity philanthropy that has captured our mental attention. I wanna tell you two quick stories about how individuals can think about and how you can frame this different question. Not about how I give because of fundraising, why I give because I'm an individual. One is a famous, maybe you've heard it, but it is a famous estate planning story of an industrialist at the turn of the century, the creator of dynamite. And this individual had given away millions of dollars. And in fact, their will, their estate plan was giving away most of his money to charity. And he received a very odd gift, turn of the century. So there wasn't any Twitter. So a weird thing happened, and the press thought that he had died, when in fact it was his brother in the next country over. And he went one morning to his own obituary on the front cover of the national newspaper. And he thought, thought okay, most of my money is going to charity. I've been a great philanthropist. I've created schools. I've advanced health care. I've given to the arts. Let's see what the world thinks of me in this obituary. And the headline of the newspaper was, hooray, the merchant of is dead. Let us celebrate putting this horrible man into the ground. Whoa! And he was like, this is not the story that I've been trying to tell. And this is not what I would want people to think of this generosity that I'm trying to express. So he thought deeply, went back, changed his will and his estate plan to have, to have a story. And that individual's name, Alfred Nobel, and that was the creation of the Nobel Peace Prize. Again, all of his money was already going to charity, but in changing the plan, he changed the narrative. Now, you no doubt know the guy on the right. If you've ever had a Caesar on a deck or been to a cottage, you know our colleague from the Tragically Hip. He also received a very odd gift in a terminal diagnosis. And he knew that he had the blessing of being connected to the DNA of Canada, at least of a certain generation. And with this terminal diagnosis, he knew that people would want to express their care for him. He had modest means, although he had family to take care of, and said, I'm going to create this narrative. Create, in his case, the Downey Wenjack Fund. I'm going to create a fund for uh, brain uh, cancer with an organization. And he said to his family, friends, and Canada, love me. Not please give, but if you love me and you want to do something, I've made it easy. Here's a bucket. You can throw money into it. And that is the nature of gift planning. We are not industrialists or famous uh, artists, but many of us have a very strong community of care who loves us and cares for us. My second question, how do you give back? As our colleague talked about uh, Joanne Ryan, who not just herself and her team and all the funds that they give and grant, but their community at TD is deeply involved in volunteerism, in action, in board leadership across the country. Well, when you think about where you spend your time, not just where you give, are we supporting those organizations? Because many people who volunteer in a community know very deeply where money is needed. You know, gift planning in the end is all about the balance between head and heart. And that's one of the great challenges out there is we don't have support when it comes to the head on charitable giving. Heart is how most people think. When it comes to the strategy of it, 
for regular everyday people, there isn't a lot of support. In the old days, we had family foundations and many of you will know family foundations. And today, families are more generous than ever. They're more complex than ever when it comes to business and the succession of money. Uh, Canadianize this a bit for you. My favorite export from Canada to the world. Although it's very interesting how many financial and estate planners use this family as an example when they think about the succession of business and money. The challenge for so many of us is we've been taught to think of the lowest denominator when it comes to charity, right? For many years, we've been told for the price of a coffee a day, you can change or save a life. But in the end, for a lot of us who are in life giving and as we age, and as we have an opportunity to give to our estate, you know, the largest amount of Canadians with the least amount of kids in the history of this country. And in fact, when I've worked with many business owners myself, cite to me something, a famous quote from Warren Buffett, that I want to give my kids enough that they can do anything, but not too much that they'll do nothing. And so many people have said, okay, if I've got three kids, the fourth is the charity child, I want to make a difference. And again, the structure of that can be confusing. We've been taught that fundraising and giving is all about bake sales and golf and chocolate almonds. I am traumatized by this confectionery because as a child, I was put on the streets to sell chocolate almonds to help my local church and community center. We've been taught that it comes to special events, it comes to granting, and only big charities get big dollars. When in fact, we need to actually think a little less with our heart a little more with our heart when it comes to allocating these funds. Most Canadians don't know that we have the most generous charitable tax system in the Western world, better than the United States, better than the United Kingdom. When it comes to in-life giving, you know, bottom line, most Canadians don't know if you use your tax receipt over $200, you're getting back about half. Most Canadians don't even use their tax receipts. And that there are charitable incentives tied to all of these types Ask that as we age, we hold more of. You, you may see that janitor bucket in the corner here. And you know, I was once inspired. We had a whole group of people who were, who were talking about giving to a faith community, a school community. Turns out the largest donation to this school of bursaries for students in need came from a high school janitor. And when we dug deeper into the story, we said, you know, what happened there? This was a janitor, his colleague was a janitor his whole life. And yet what happened was when he talked to his financial planner, as they were planning their will and estate, he said, look, what are my priorities in my life? I do have children and I do have heirs and I want to take care of my house, but I do care about these kids that I served my whole life and I want the poorest among them to have opportunities. I don't know what to do. You tell me. And their advisor said, you have a life insurance policy that is paid up, that you're not using as part of your financial plan and we could donate that. He didn't think twice about it, but after he passed away, it was almost six figures and it was one of the biggest gifts to make change. We now see, and our colleague Joanne is gonna to touch on this, the growth in different opportunities to give to planning better. One of them is donor advised funds in public foundations. The Economist, the Globe and Mail is telling us this is one of the most effective ways to plan. And I will encourage you, please, to think deeper about how you give, to consult your advisors in it, because otherwise, we're back to fundraising. I deeply love the arts, but I know that these methods of fundraising and giving are not going to save the institutions we care about. I myself am a person of faith, and yet I know the churches that I care about and go to, we have this data that in the next 10 years, a lot of our faith institutions are going to have challenges. They haven't talked to their congregations about how we support. You've got to think about what you care about. And I am blown away when I travel the country and talk to regional habitat teams about the work in, in their local communities. Let me share a little bit of Inside Baseball with you. This book, Inside the Mind of the Bequest Donor, talks about the mindset of people who give in this way through their estate and how it's different than traditional fundraising. He did something pretty cool. This researcher at Texas Tech University put donors in an MRI machine and then brochures to them for six hours and then saw what part of the brain 
lit up depending on the type of giving they were talking about. Fundraising was warm, fuzzy, and feel. The most powerful giving through our will and estate was tied to the bar part of the brain responsible for autobiography. So as you are thinking about what you want to do, think about your life story. Think about your values. My last question is what if there was a better way? And that is planning. The good news is you focus on the heart and you've got a partner to help you with the head. And that is the advisors. Now we as CGP, and you're gonna hear in the next year a campaign we're launching across the country called Will Power. And you'll be seeing billboards and television, all of that reminding us that because of Canada's generous tax system, you are giving not just of taxes, but you are giving your charitable tax credits can offset 100% of your income tax as part of your estate. So it's not an either or between your family. You can do both. You're going to see us advancing this narrative in your community. You know, when we asked advisors, are you talking to your clients deeply about planning their giving, they said yes. And then we did a Canadian Ipsos Read study and talked to Canadians in every province and they said, no, they're not. So we've got some more resources for you. And we're happy to share how you can come together with your own advisor to have a conversation with the head motivated by the heart to make a difference. Connect your purpose with the plan and your philanthropy can be deep. We know you care. You know that your life story has way more than just the state of giving. And again, the fundraising that we are all afflicted by. Think deeper about your story and your values. And there's a one expression of your own legacy. In the end, it's not where do you want to give. It's how do you want to be remembered. I hope that's been helpful as we start our discussion today. Thanks to the Habitat team for having me and look forward to the Q&A and hope we hear from you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I, I've been jotting down notes as you were coming along uh, there, and I am sad that you were traumatized by the chocolate almond sales. I would just like to note that I think I also have a bit of that trauma deep rooted in me. Um, but you make some very excellent points. I hope in the question and answer portion, we'll uh, get to some of the uh, comments that you made and expand. Um, I'm going to pass things over to Joanne. Uh, Joanne Ryan and uh, ask her to pick up where Paul left off. Joanne? Uh, thank you, Christina. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so my role at TD is to ensure we're, we are incorporating philanthropy as part of advice to our clients. And I spend a lot of time working with our advisors to, uh, to help them to do this. And we actually have uh, four pillars in private wealth management at TD. They are build net worth, implement tax efficient strategies, protect what matters, and the fourth pillar is leave a legacy. And so for many of our clients, that legacy is a charitable legacy. And I just want to uh, define philanthropy. It's not giving the gazillion million dollars. It's derived from the Greek, means love of humankind, uh, giving, caring, and intention. And it's giving time, talent, and treasure uh, for the public good. And, um, and so really the, the way we define philanthropy as opposed to charitable giving is giving in a way that reflects your values as opposed to we've all been there where someone asks you for money, you write a check and you don't really give it a lot of thought. Um, and so really if you're helping your neighbor, uh, if you're giving back to the community, you are a philanthropist. There are lots of different motivations for giving. And we're going to talk a little bit, as Paul alluded, uh, we have the most uh, generous tax incentives when it comes to charitable giving in Canada. But that's not the number one motivator for giving. I mean, people give because they feel compassion towards people in need, to help a cause they personally believe in, to give back to the community. Um, and tax is actually low, uh, really low. However, uh, we do spend time uh, working with our clients to ensure that they are giving in a very tax efficient manner because if they are, they can actually maximize their impact. So again, strategic philanthropy is a process of becoming intentional about your giving of money and time by investing in issues that articulate your values. 
Uh, lots of different trends in giving in Canada, which I think makes this uh, a really exciting time for planned giving. Uh, we talk about the intergenerational wealth transfer in the financial institutions, and a lot of the people inheriting this money um, are successful themselves and, and, and don't need it. Uh, so we're seeing an increased interest in leaving that bequest in the will to charity. Uh, we've seen women growing in wealth, and TD has done a lot of research uh, in this particular area. Women's life expectancy is greater than men, um, so they often inherit twice uh, from uh, parents and then from, from a partner um, or a spouse. Um, and uh, as you know, people are not leaving it all to their kids. And, uh, and then there are a whole subset of people that don't have children, and so really uh, philanthropy becomes a second child or becomes a child for them. So uh, not to dwell on the tax, uh, but the way our tax system works in Canada is if you have any income or wealth, your tax dollars are going to go to Ottawa. Uh, that's how it works. So you can sit back and say, I like the way they're spending my money. I'm good with it. Um, or you can say, I want to actually take some of that social capital back in the form of tax credits that are available for charitable giving and allocate it to things that I care about. And, uh, and that's really what it, it's about. So um, as Paul said, you get half of it back. If you donate appreciated securities, you eliminate the capital gains tax. And normally, um, if you were to sell those securities, 50% of the gain would be taxed as income. So you're always better off to donate securities as opposed to cash. Even if you love the stock and think there's a lot more upside potential, uh, you, um, you can donate it and you uh, get the receipt, you eliminate the capital gains tax, and you can buy it back immediately so that you've just uh, stepped up um, your cost to the new uh, market value. And there are some limits in terms of what people, what you can claim. You can claim donations up to 75% of your net income. If you exceed that, you can carry it forward for five years. Um, and in the year of death, that goes up uh, to 100% of your net income. And, um, and back, uh, if you exceed that, you can go back and claim up to 100% of your income in the year preceding death. So there are lots of ways to give to charity. Uh, you can write a check, they'll gladly take, take your check. As I said, you can donate securities. We see, uh, when we're looking at deferred gifts, um, we see uh, actually a lot of Canadians have built up um, sizable registered plans. Uh, they build up these large RSPs, and of course they don't use the funds when they're in an RSP. In the year they turn 71, they have to convert it to a RIF. Um, and then there, there's a forced withdrawal every year, which is taxable. So we're seeing a lot of our clients uh, direct that to charity. And also we're seeing them, um, we're, we're basically seeing them well, direct it to charity as well as naming um, a charity as a, as a beneficiary of that RIF. Uh, because eventually upon the death of the second spouse, that is taxable. And, um, and so that helps offset the tax. Uh, and then certainly straight bequests are a great way uh, to update your will and to consider leaving a bequest uh, to charity in your will. Um, it helps, um, it certainly helps the charity uh, if they know that that bequest is, is in the plans. Um, it allows you to plan uh, with the charity in terms of how those funds are going to be used and, uh, and charities will give you the bequest wording so that you can take it to your lawyer. We're seeing an increased interest in using life insurance as a um, life insurance as a, a planned gift. As Paul alluded to, people have life insurance policies that they don't need anymore. Maybe they bought them before they were financially successful or um, they had dependents and now the dependents are older and they're successful. So giving that life insurance policy and getting a valuation and a receipt for the market value can be tax efficient today and leave that legacy down the road um, when, the, when the charity actually receives it. Donor advised funds are one of the fastest growing vehicles in, uh, in Canada. Uh, they're simple, easy alternatives to establishing your own private foundation. So you don't need to go to a lawyer and set up a non-share capital corporation. They're typically public foundations. We have one called Private Giving Foundation. It's independent from the bank, and uh, but 
but the bank does all the administration associated with it. And for as little as $10,000, you can open your mini sub foundation account. You can name it any way you want. You can, we actually have a lot that are named in memory of someone in order to honor them and to continue to support charities that were actually uh, important to them. Uh, we're seeing in a pandemic that donor advised funds are really, have really been helpful because um, people, people committed funds to charity through their donor advised funds, usually in good times, uh, never could have imagined a crisis like a pandemic. And then, and then when the pandemic hit, they were in the perfect position to redirect those funds uh, to all kinds of organizations, uh, whether it's food banks or organizations helping the homeless who were in desperate need of funds um, as a result of, uh, of COVID-19. And, and my final point um, I, I would make is it's important to develop a philanthropic plan. And um, because there's 86,000 registered charities out there and they all are asking for money, you can't support them all. So if you go through a process to develop a plan, um, we ask questions, you know, what values are important to you and to your family? And we actually have a list of values we can you know, help you identify your top three or your top one. Uh, match those values to causes uh, that are that are important to you. Uh, decide uh, where you want to focus. Uh, some people like to support charities that are very local. Um, some more provincial, national, or international. So define your geography, um, and then research uh, research your options. And there's some great websites out there that will give you a good snapshot of what the organization does, what their financials look like, so that you can actually uh, you can actually do your due diligence in um, in deciding what organizations you want to support. And um, you know, certainly designate your donation. Talk to the gift planning officer at the charity um, and um, talk about the impact that you want to make. And uh, it, it, it also allows the charities to thank you uh, for the gift that they will receive down the road. In the case of a bequest, they can thank you. Um, but it also ensures that um, your wishes uh, will be reflected in terms of how that gift uh, is actually used. So definitely uh, my advice is to uh, develop a philanthropic plan that reflects your values. And in fact, what families tell me who have gone through that process is it becomes easier to say no when a request comes in. It might be for a very, very good cause, um, but not what you and your family have decided is important uh, for you. Uh, so those are my, my comments, and uh, I look forward to the Q&A. Thanks so very much, Joanne. Um, I know that I don't want my tax dollars to go to Ottawa, so I'm going to look at my own social capital and make sure I make some of my own decisions in uh, philanthropic planning. I look forward to chatting with you during the Q&A. Uh, we're going to move over to Tara George now and uh, looking to Tara for her perspective and her own personal lens on everything we've been chatting about regarding plan gifts. Tara. Thank you, Christina, for the introduction and thank you to Joanne and Paul for their earlier comments. Um, I guess I'm just everyday people and I'm not a millionaire, but I am a philanthropist as, uh, as Joanne has defined it. Um, for me personally, leaving a legacy means seeing my values and my commitment to a better and more equal society being lived out beyond my lifetime. So as I examine what matters most to me, um, this is really based on my values and it's reflected in my giving and volunteering. So I thought about this before the presentation and I realized I give uh, philanthropically to all of the organizations where I volunteer. And I'm gonna link that back in in a few minutes. I first became involved with Habitat for Humanity when I lived in New Brunswick about, I guess about 20 years ago, not quite. Um, I really care about social justice and equality and I saw Habitat as an organization that cares about these issues too. Um, I was working at, um, an independent school uh, in, in development as a fundraiser. And I, as a volunteer, I led two March break collegiate chapter trips to the US with students who attended the school that I worked at. And then I became aware of a new chapter starting up in 
in St. John. So that was exciting to see that Habitat chapter get off the ground. Um, around that time, I was, I was going on a big vacation and there had been uh, a bombing in London during the G8 conference protests uh, in Edinburgh. And since I was going to Scotland, my wise mother suggested that I create a will. And remember, um, Paul talked about giving patterns being passed down. That was in the Imagine Canada and Rideau Hall Foundation report. And so my mother and father passed that the, uh, importance of giving back to community. They, they passed that value down to me. And so I listened to my mother and discussed with my husband at the time, and we didn't have children. So we decided to leave all of our estate to charities if we both passed away. And um, since Habitat was a charity that we had both been involved with, um, Habitat made the list of the six to eight charities that we included in that initial will. And I say initial will because it has been changed twice since. Um, shortly thereafter, we moved back to Ontario and it was natural to get involved with Habitat Toronto as it was called at the time. And at that time, I also became a monthly donor because for me, monthly giving is the easiest way to give. Uh, it allows me to give a bit more than I might normally um, give if I just give one check, so to speak. Um, in any case, uh, in Toronto, I was less interested in build volunteering. I was finding myself interested in um, and the families and in the process of family selection. So I was, uh, I had the opportunity, I was very grateful to have the opportunity to be involved in the family selection committee. And it was an incredibly meaningful volunteer opportunity for me. And to date, I would still say it's the most meaningful volunteer opportunity I've ever had uh, myself. It was really interesting and both um, heartbreaking and inspiring. Uh, to learn so much about the families who applied to the Habitat program and have a chance to meet with them and, um, and to see their exciting journeys forward. Um, in the past few years, to be honest, I've become a little less connected with, with Habitat, as volunteers sometimes do. We have busy lives, all of us. Um, but Christina and her team do a really terrific job of keeping in touch with me as a donor and making me feel valued and keeping me informed. Um, and I was thrilled to agree to help when she called me about this webinar. My day job is as a partner of KCI. We're a leading philanthropic consulting firm in Canada. And I lead our executive search and talent practice. So I think Christina knew that I could bring some um, philanthropic expertise to today's conversation, as well as my uh, perspective as a donor and volunteer. I, I like what Christina said, you know, um, I'll be able to talk about the financial, but also the emotional benefits of uh, making a planned gift. So, so why is gift planning and legacy giving important to Canadian charities? I know that some of you um, on the uh, webinar today are, are across the country with different Habitat chapters. And I would say from a fundraising professional point of view as a consultant, because gift planning and legacy giving can and should comprise a significant proportion of your organization's philanthropic plan. Um, so we all know and as Paul um, has mentioned, and, and also Joanne, um, a gift in estate plans is, is often the largest gift that any person will make, um, you know, for, for your, your average, average just people, um, that's gonna be our largest gift ever. And uh, it was hard to find gift planning data, but our analytics team did a bit of digging and, and sources I saw suggested that the average Canadian bequest is around the order of $35,000. Paul might have some thoughts on that. And what I couldn't find data to support this next point, my past experience as a fundraiser um, suggested to me that many times bequests are unrestricted, meaning flexible dollars for the charity to use for highest priorities. And we know that unrestricted funds are really critical and important to charities, um, all charities, including Habitat. We also know from a study by Good Works in 2019 that about 40% of Canadian households have a will they estimated the value of that at about 216 billion and said that about 17% of those households had named a charity other than a church or religious entity in their will. So um, I know some other studies have showed different numbers, but regardless, the number's not zero. So there's upside potential here for all charitable organizations to think about their gift planning revenue streams. We um, at our firm recently did some analysis and benchmarking with hospital foundations across Canada. And what we learned from that data is that um, some hospital foundations receive as much as 30% of their annual revenue um, on average from bequests and other planned gifts. Now, unfortunately, some of those hospital foundations also reported that they received 0% 
from um, requests and planned gifts. Well, which could mean, thankfully, to be frank, nobody died, which is good news, but more likely means that nobody left that particular hospital foundation in their estate plans, maybe because they were never asked. So I do think that each charitable organization should be aware of the average bequest value for your specific organization. In other words, when you, you know, do a five-year average, what's the, what's the average bequest year over year that you're receiving um, in total? And what, what is the uh, average proportion of plan giving revenue in comparison to your other revenue streams like annual giving or um, restore uh, revenue and so forth? And then you can start as a charity to approximate your potential cash flow and even start to consider how to grow that revenue by asking for bequests um, through and through great donor stewardship and engagement. So I'm not sure if, how people reacted when I talked about asking for bequests, but what I mean by that is charities can start by sharing information about legacy giving with donors. You can plant the seed and you can water it. Some people like me have already chosen to leave Habitat in their estate plans and you won't know who we are unless you invite us to self-identify. Not everybody will do that, and, you know, that's fine. Um, some people will tell you, and as Joanne said, it allows you to thank them while they're still with us. It allows you to also further engage them in the work that Habitat does because clearly they care. They care about Habitat already. So sometimes that engagement will lead to all sorts of increased benefits for the donor and for the organization through their giving and volunteering, which is good for you and it makes the donor feel great. Um, other people may consider making the quest after receiving information or being um, even asked to consider Habitat in their estate plans. The people who are most likely to consider would be those donors who are already giving to Habitat. So those might be your, your loyal annual donors, your monthly donors. And I would say, don't forget volunteers and staff members. Um, remember at the beginning, I said that I give to every organization I volunteer with. So um, I think I would actually be upset if the charities I volunteer for um, didn't think it was important to ask me if I'd like to contribute charitably in some manner, like, like they shouldn't assume what my intentions are, they should leave that up to me by presenting the information and letting me make my own decisions. So I'm a big proponent of, of asking volunteers and staff, they can absolutely always say no, but if they don't get asked, they might actually feel a bit ignored. Um, and then also, of course, you all know, once you, once you learn about someone's bequest intentions, I think it's critical to really keep people informed, to give people opportunities to engage in a manner that um, really um, keeps us, engage in a manner that we each choose. So, and I think if you do that well, if, we, if all charities do that well, they'll, they'll likely keep those donors giving to Habitat throughout their lives, um, pending any big life changes, so. Um, so those are, those are my comments. And uh, I can tell you through my own experience, Habitat does a great job with stewardship and uh, I'm proud to be a donor and a volunteer and to uh, include Habitat as a beneficiary in my own estate plans. This has been a paid announcement by Christina Politis at Habitat for Humanity. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, I know uh, we are very fortunate to have you um, as a volunteer and as a supporter for many, many years, and I appreciate you joining us today. I'm going to ask our other panelists to come back on screen, please. And, uh, and we're going to just move into um, a little bit of uh, the question and answer portion of the webinar. Um, Ultimately, uh, we've been given some great information and actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, backtrack. What I am going to ask first is Deanna to put the second poll question up. Mm -hmm. Just for a second, I apologize. Uh, Deanna, if you could, and I'm going to ask our participants to answer this question uh, before we move into the question and answers. Having heard now from our panelists, are you more likely to consider adding a charitable bequest in your will? So if we've done our job, these numbers should go up. Okay, we still have to convince a few more people. We might have to do another webinar. Um, uh, I think we're going to just, uh, 
give it a couple more seconds, but we're at 93%. I think that's pretty good. 93% say, you know, they're more likely to think about it. And that is what we're trying to do today is trying to get everyone feeling more comfortable with the concept of looking into uh, what a bequest uh, in our will, a charitable bequest might do or why we might want to um, consider it. So um, that is uh, what we've got, 93%. Okay. Uh, let's go into some question and answers. Um, there's been some great comments all the way across, and uh, I have my thoughts on a few things, but I want to actually start um, with Paul again. Um, dispelling the myth a little bit more. Uh, one of the comments here is, you know, yeah, but I have to be wealthy to do this. And I know Joanne and, and Tara both touched on this too. Even Tara said, I'm not a millionaire remind people, like, let's dispel this uh, myth. I know you talked a little bit. Could you add to that? Yeah, and, and you know what, jo Joanne touched on it right away, which is we have the data to understand why Canadians give. Wonderful report put on by the Mutart Foundation in collaboration with the Globe and Mail on why Canadians give. And we know they give because number one, they care. And number two, they're connected to causes and they want to solve problems in their community. It, this is about the heart. And so, you know, again, philanthropy is not done by philanthropists. That's an American uh, kind of mythology. And here in Canada, it's regular everyday people who are just trying to make a difference in the causes they care about, in the problems they want to solve in their local community and here in Canada. And if we just step forward to say, here's what I can do, here's how I can help. Again, to a couple people cited monthly giving, you know, you got to make it affordable. And again, this is why we encourage more people to say, start small. And talk to your advisor to say you it's your job to make this easy for me and it's such a challenge that so many people don't use the incentives that the government give us and they don't think more deeply and they respond to when they're asked so it's time for us to take control to stop giving it all those cash registers and their family you know i talked to business owners and one guy said to me i have never given with both hands freely one hand has always been twisted behind my back and golf and a brother-in-law has usually been involved. Mm. And, and that's the challenge is so many times, you know, we, we, we respond as opposed to spending some time thinking more deeply and responding to what we care about. And then slowly as time goes on, often as we age and life gets more complex in a good way, then we bring some strategy to the table, but start with the heart and then balance with the head. Tina, can Thank I you. pick up on, on yeah. what Paul was just saying? Just wanna add, one thing, it was a really interesting lesson I had as a, as a young fundraiser and manager is, um, you know, sometimes we don't think about, um, we don't think about the full spectrum of, of donors. And um, I remember I was working at a university and I had a, um, a young woman who was, who had just graduated working as a supervisor in the call center who was calling alumni to thank them for their gifts and to ask them for gifts. And uh, this one, young woman came to me one day, and uh, I remember Talia was her name, Talia, actually, she pronounced it. And uh, she came and said, can you, can you help me understand if I could designate the university as the recipient to my employee life insurance policy, um, and also her employee pension. And that was a really good learning for me to not assume that um, it's only a certain, um, like it's only rich people who can, can give, like to Paul's point, anyone can. And this was a way of, you know, hopefully she's having a very long and healthy life. Um, but this is a good way for us to remember, you know, it's there's many different vehicles. I think Joanne touched on, you know, there's life insurance, there's RSPs and RIFs. So there are a number of different vehicles for individuals to think about and also for the fundraising professionals and advisor partners to help plant the seeds in water as well. So what if you don't have a financial advisor? And I mean, you know, um, I for one don't have necessarily have a large um, estate. I'm not a millionaire either. But what if I didn't have a financial advisor? Who, who do I go to to get some guidance on this? You know, when we right now see what donors are doing across the country, donors are turning to, you know, regular Canadians are planning more than ever. Right. So again, different ages and stages of life, we see, you know, we see more people using, you know, their online banking comes with the different types of advice in this space. 
Um, but the challenge is a lot of it is based on just savings and that financial plan and doesn't include philanthropy as part of that. For many people, it's an expense like anything else, but they, they just haven't understood the basic concepts that again, when you give in Canada, anything above $200, just regular everyday giving, you're getting back about half if you're using your tax receipt. So these are some of the basics and we talked about them, how to slowly grow your giving over time in a simple way. Think about starting monthly giving. Think about for a lot of people who are older and may hold securities, that is a method in which one can give in which there's a greater benefit. But um, you know, again, for our colleagues from Habitat on the phone, we also got to not assume that the people that we serve and support and work with don't have advisors in this space, right? We, we do a lot of assuming just like, again, that, that big campaign from a school board and it was the high school janitor who made the largest gift because they simply mentioned it as they were starting to do in their case, simply their will plan with an estate lawyer. So we don't wanna do assumptions. We wanna make it as easy as possible. Just think how can we grow over time comfortably? Thanks, uh, Paul. Joanne, um, what's the benefit or, or, or how can you go about uh, deciding whether you should leave personal property, for example, as opposed to, I know you touched on cash and gifts of securities being the, uh, gifts of securities being the better way to do it. What if people have personal property? Um, and I'm not just thinking about a, a house or real estate, but other properties. Are there pros or cons to, to leaving that type of request? So right now on a principal residence, there is no capital gains tax um, if you even sell it. So I would say most charities, uh, rather than inheriting your, your home, would probably prefer that it gets sold and then they, they receive the cash so that they can do as a, as a, in accordance with their mission. Um, Really, I, I think it's a, a question, it's not necessarily just a tax question. Um, there's been lots of lobbying about private company shares and giving um, investment property uh, to eliminate the capital gains for, for that. Currently, there, there, you, do, you do incur capital gains if you donate those, those properties. So there isn't a tax incentive associated with it. But I think you really need, you really need to talk to the charity because um, you know, I talk to people all the time that they perhaps own land and it's a farm and they think it's the perfect thing to give to this organization, um, but the organization really can't use that land. Or I've spoken to people who say, I want to give my home because it would make a great women's shelter. But if you look at, look at the strategic plan for that charity, that wouldn't fit with what their direction is. So, I mean, obviously, if you're giving to an arts organization, uh, you you know it, it might make sense to give you might be giving art and there are some preferred tax ta tax benefits to doing that same with environmental charities so you need to you need to talk to someone um, about the overall tax implication and the financial plan but you also need to talk to the charity that you're considering making that gift to the last thing a charity needs is a surprise when your will lands on their desk and they find they're the you know the new owner of whatever it, it is that you've decided would be the perfect gift for them. So you need to have those conversations. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, anything to add, Tara? Go ahead. Yeah, I would just like to add just to build in what Joanne was saying is um, um, particularly for Habitat, because you're a bit unique as a charity where I totally agree, most organizations would probably want you to sell the real estate or property. Habitat might be slightly different in some geographies where you might be actually, um, you might have more advantage to actually acquire the property, uh, even if you were to tear down and rebuild something on that property because of the, uh, just of all the cost of all the, the um, well, the land, I'm thinking I live in Toronto yeah. and it's so hard to just to get land to build on in Toronto, I know for Habitat. So mm -hmm. I think this speaks to the importance of, of charities having very clear gift acceptance policies and I would even include that the charity should have those posted in a public place, public place on their website so that it's really easy for donors mm -hmm. and donors advisors, um, particularly their lawyers to be able to, to see that information. And I think this also speaks to, I, I just have to reemphasize what Joanne said. Uh, I know it can be uncomfortable and a bit weird to call a charity to say, oh, by the way, I have put you in my estate plans and can we talk about this? I remember the first time I did that, um, but it becomes really important because sometimes 
through our own enthusiasm, we might accidentally put something in our estate plans that ties the charity's hands and then they can't accept the gifts or they can't use the gift the way you wanted to. So like if their gift acceptance policy said that they can't accept real estate and you left the house, suddenly you're costing the charity because they have to get into litigation. You know, you don't want to cost the charity that you care about a lot of money or you might be giving a, a bequest to start a, a bursary, a university, and you might have some, you know, I've seen, unfortunately, I've been in universities where people left money in their state plans. I remember at Guelph, someone left um, like millions of dollars to home economics and the university doesn't have a home economics program. Yeah, that's so Tara, that's, Tara, thank you so much, but it does go back to what you just landed on, which was uh, talk to the charity, right? The, we and really do need to do that part of it as a donor. I want to note, uh, we've got some colleagues uh, have got some great comments in the chat. Yes. Uh, you know, thank you to our colleague Shauna asking about donating a home and what's the right, right advisor to talk to. The key thing is to talk to an advisor who is schooled in this kind of planning, either in life, in financial planning, or as part of estate planning. You know, the challenge is, is people often want to save money. And you can absolutely still order from your Indigo Online an $80 will kit. But you know what the estate lawyers say is you're going to pay us up front or you're going to pay a thousand times in litigation, right? You don't want to not just tie the hands of the charity. You don't want to hurt your family. You don't want to hurt the people who are benefiting from your estate. It's really important to plan up front. So to make sure that the money goes to the right part of the mission, talk to the charity. And to make sure that your, your interest and your family is protected, it is important to always talk to an advisor who specializes in this. And, you know, that's what people like Joanne, and she trains advisors across the country. She writes for major Canadian publications and things like that. And has been very helpful for a lot of teams, even Habitat teams all across the board and uh, connecting to advisors. And that's what we do at CEGP as well. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I'm just going to ask one of my colleagues uh, with Habitat Canada, Hava, uh, I think you received a question that you were hoping to uh, present to our panelists as well. Can you just? Uh... Yeah. Yes, so I received a question um, more specific to what Joanne mentioned about the government lobbying. So we have someone on the webinar who is wondering if CAGP specifically is lobbying the government to expand the capital gains exemption from securities and other assets such as a second residence. Uh, and I'm happy to jump in on that as our representative CEGP. That is indeed exactly what we're doing. With help from leaders like Joanne, who's part of our government relations committee, we've been working for the better part of a decade now to extend capital gains elimination on gifts of real estate, as well as uh, private securities. So, you know, the government and the deficit being where it is right now, we don't expect for that to happen anytime soon. But in from a planning perspective, that is one of the strong things that we are working towards. Uh, I'll note a colleague of ours he's here has also mentioned uh, the role of community foundations uh, in this conversation. And again, that is one of the things that is really helpful uh, for our colleagues from Habitat in that we're working with uh, community foundations across Canada, I was uh, just doing a session this morning with uh, several dozen advisors who are helping clients plan with a community foundation. And they are there to help more donors meet you to help more individuals learn about your impact on the local community. Again, I cannot stress enough, Tara mentioned it, even Joanne mentioned it as well, about how many people don't know all of what Habitat does and don't know all of what Habitat does in your community. I live in North Toronto. The first time I visited Barrie and Georgian Bay, I was like, Yo, there's so much more here than just the old ReStore and your classic mission. You're doing some innovative stuff. And the challenge is, who knows it? because you can't assume donors know it. People aren't always subscribing to your newsletters, making sure that community foundations, your colleagues at United Way and the advisors in your community slowly get to know you better is a way to make sure that more donors learn about the mission at the critical times. Because again, Joanne has represented many business owners who one might not identify as philanthropic, but in that business sale, in transition in times of their life, presenting philanthropy as an option and yes, a tax saving, has resulted in some really significant donations and gift plans. I'd love to win if you would share one of those stories because it's been quite impactful on us at CGP. In Canada today, um, two thirds of our high net worth clients are self-made 
And so what does that mean? Um, if you inherit money, you're still generous, um, but you also view your role as a steward or custodian of those assets to pass on to the next generation. If you have made it yourself, and I work with people that have built businesses, very successful businesses, could be a shoe store, could be whatever it is. When they sell that business, uh, they're very grateful to the community that supported them and helped them to acquire their wealth. And so, you know, they very much want to give back as a thank you uh, to support uh, that particular that particular community. So uh, I think we're seeing as you know as people have made money, some have been very successful. They started with very little. They've seen a lot of volatility in their net worth. It's not as scary to give a chunk of, of money away, and they're very very grateful to um, to their community. And um, you know I'll just say one thing about community foundations. They they specialize in understanding the needs of their local community that they represent. They produce a vital signs report annually that highlights, you know, where the, the areas are in the city or in their community that um, are that need help, whether it's food insecurity or it's homelessness, et cetera. So they're a fantastic resource in terms of understanding the pressing needs of the community. So organizations like Habitat need to have great relationships with them so they understand um, what it is they're doing in, in the area of homelessness, et cetera. And, um, and then, you know, community foundations will partner with um, lawyers, investment advisors, financial advisors in order to um, come up with best solutions for donors that they're serving also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can I quickly? Okay, go ahead, Tara. Just, sorry, I know we're, we're wrapping quickly? up here, but sorry, um, I, yeah. just, I wanted to just mention how important it is for each um, Habitat affiliate to have really easy to find and clearly spelled out contact person for, um, for your community to contact. So to make it really clear who to talk to about an estate plan, make it really clear who to talk to about a gift of shares. Um, or a gift of real estate so that the donor and or the advisors can reach out directly to someone. I did have a personal experience. Um, and this goes back to the first time I made a will. I called those six to eight charities. Some didn't get back to me. A couple yeah. told me we don't do that, which is completely incorrect. Like you, um, you need to have it. I would advise that you need to have your, your um, whoever's answering your phones be aware so to make sure throughout your organization that everybody knows what to do when you get that call and who to direct it to because you can have a you can imagine if someone's reaching out and they're nervous and feeling a little uncomfortable to start with to get the wrong information we don't do that or to not get a call back suddenly you lost them as a donor and probably as a volunteer at that point Thanks so much, Tara. That's actually the perfect segue for us to cue putting up in the chat the contact information for where you can, if uh, you're interested in learning more about uh, making a bequest to, to Habitat for Humanity, uh, you're encouraged to reach out to either Alex or Hava, my colleagues. Uh, we've provided their contact info, or you can just go online to uh, www.habitat.ca uh, on our website and get contact information there. Uh, I am noticing that we are right at two o'clock, so I apologize to my panelists. I was hoping uh, to have one more minute to quickly go around and thank you personally. So, en masse, thank you so very much for uh, helping us today. I know we didn't get to all of the questions. Uh, I do hope that the people that are on the session will reach out to the Habitat uh, GTA staff. This is about thinking about your uh, pet charities. It may not be Habitat. We're hoping we can convince you that it can be us. Uh, but ultimately, it really is about helping you understand that there should be not a fear. Uh, ask the questions, um, ask your advisors, ask your friends, talk to your family, and think about how you can make a difference and what you want your legacy to be. Thank you so very much to everyone for uh, joining us. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much.